first and foremost, Tunde, it is a privilege to have the opportunity to chat with you. You have uh, impacted so many lives. Congratulations on Speak. It must be a whirlwind th these past few weeks. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, the, the last few weeks have been wildly fulfilling, wildly fulfilling, wild, crazy, um, and just crazy beautiful, just really great. And so what inspired you to write this book? I mean, you, you really go in and you talk about a lot. You look back on a lot, the highs, the lows, the lessons. Uh, what inspired you to really put, put pen to paper with this? Well, you know, I said in third grade that I wanted to write a book without even living the story yet. Um, so, so the, the thought from third grade uh, Tune Day has traveled with me my entire life. Why now? Uh, the last two years have been filled with so much uncertainty and so much doubt for so many people. My story is one of so much uncertainty and so much doubt. My hope is that you open this book, you see bits and pieces of yourself within my story, and then you close the book and you feel so inspired to write out the next chapter of, of your life. And it was the perfect time because there are so many parts of your story that people can connect with, whether, you know, in a different industry or anything like that, starting new, um, loss, grief, all of these uh, life really happenings. Um, I want to take it back though, to the blue light moment. Uh, when you describe that it was, I've never heard someone call it a blue light moment. So I'm curious if you can, can talk about that and how that really changed the tra trajectory and brought you to where you are now. I was living in LA at the time I traveled to New York for business. I was in a career that no longer served me. I devoted, I think at that time, 12 or 13 years of my life. Uh, to my craft and then woke up and realized that it didn't serve me anymore. And so I was in, again, in this, this, this space of doubt and uncertainty. I traveled to New York. Uh, during this business trip, I decided to try out a cycling class for the, my first time. Mm -hmm. I left the cycling class, walking back to my hotel. I realized that my walk turns into a skip and then the skip turns into a hop. And within a matter of five seconds, I feel this wave of blue energy move from my fingers to my toes. And within a matter of five seconds, I knew that I'd be cycling for the rest of my life. I knew that I would be teaching it. And I knew that I'd be able to impact the lives of hundreds of thousands of millions of people by virtue um, of the bike. I could have very easily said that I was hallucinating or dehydrated from that cycling class, but instead I took it as what it was, this divine download of information. I think that the beauty of uncertainty is infinite possibility. When you don't know what's next, anything can be next. And knowing what you know keeps you knowing only what you know. So I took this leap of faith. I'd love to say that it was a fairy tale after that, but there were ups and downs and imposter syndrome and everything in between. Um, and then ultimately, I decided to, to do it anyways. I decided to, to get up and just do it anyways. And push past that fear. And you, so you talk about it wasn't the fairy tale after, and we look at you now as, as this successful, strong woman, but I love in your book, how you talk, how you talk about failure and how it doesn't exist in your, in your, your perspective on that. How did reframing failure in, in that process and in that growth from that moment in New York city to, to now, how did reframing that really impact your success and your growth? Yeah, I think that failure isn't real. I think that failure is something that we tell ourselves so that we have an out, uh, so that we can stop trying. I think about a little child that hasn't yet learned to walk. They crawl and they crawl and crawl and they stumble. Yeah. No one has told this child that they will indeed walk. And yet still, even after a failed attempt, they continue to try over and over again until they get it right. And so uh, that that was my viewpoint on it. After having tried out for Peloton, not getting the job the first time around, but yet knowing that this vision that I saw to have been so certain uh, to get up and to continue to try again. And mind you, I think it's worth mentioning that as I had this vision, this grand idea that my life's was destined to lead on the stage, on the platform. At the time, I didn't even know what Peloton was. And still I saw this vision to be so certain and so clear. 
And this wasn't, you know, you, you said this was your first cycling class, not knowing what Peloton was, but fitness at this point in your life had created a lot of change and a lot of transformation for you physically, but also emotionally and mentally talk about the decision to find fitness and movement and how that really changed your growth. Sure. I mean, I was the kid who tried out for every single sport and never made the cut. And so now to not only be a Peloton instructor, but also a Nike athlete, it's, it's wildly surreal, surreal. I was, uh, not confident. Uh, I had low self-esteem. I never laughed too loud because I felt like if I laughed, people would see me. And if they saw me, they'd see my size. If anyone's ever taken a class with me, you know, I like to dance a lot. Uh, I never danced then because I felt like if I danced, then again, you would see me. And then if you saw me, you'd recognize my size. I decided to, to make a forever change. And what's been so unique about my story is that I lost weight, but what I gained has superseded what I lost. I lost 70 pounds. I gained a sense of confidence. I gained a sense of purpose. I gained a sense of understanding my power and, and who I am. And so, um, that's the part that, that you can't trade for anything. I want to visit power because it's such an important part, I think, of, of all that you stand for and all that you you share with people. When was it that you recognized the power of words and the power that your words had to impact others? Yeah, in my book, Speak, I, I talk about the first time um, that I recognized my power. I was speaking at my little brother's funeral and I felt this drumbeat almost this energy moved through my body as if I, words were coming out of my mouth before I formed the thought. In that moment, I recognized that hum, that drumbeat as I referred to it, uh, linked to my purpose. My purpose is to lead and that is my power. Speak is actually an acronym Surrender, power, empathy, authenticity, and knowledge. When I surrender results in change, change that leads to growth, my power is connected to my purpose, that tingly thing that I feel when I'm doing what I'm here to do. Empathy is rooted in love, not just love for other people, but self-love. I don't know how to love you if I can't love myself first. Authenticity is the intersection of truth and trust, having the audacity to show up as you truly are. And then lastly, knowledge. Echoes of the past inform the future. Every misstep, every opportunity has led me to this moment. So I trust that I'll move into the next moment. And so Speak is really this, not only uh, a memoir, but a guide that I've created for other people to be able to live their lives, not only more purposefully, but also more freely. Another part I love in the book when you, I feel like it was a recurring theme was your community and your family, your parents, your siblings, um, Kim and Christy, you have your Peloton community. How, how important and what role did curating a community that was honest, that was unwavering, and that was committed, how, what role did that play in your life? Or does oh, it the, the biggest role, the biggest role. I think that when you show up as you truly are, your people are better able to find you. I always say like my, my friend's friends are like that Christina Yang, Meredith Gray, if you're a Grey's Anatomy fan, you get this analogy. They're like my people, people. And so when you show up as you truly are, you're able to form those lasting, pure and beautiful uh, connections and relationships that, that honestly, I feel so fortunate and so lucky to be able to, to say that I have. Oh, I think it was so cool in the book because you, you feel like you meet them and then you're like, wait a second, they're really, this is really cool relationship. Um, they're lucky many, to have that. In many ways, Speak is also a love story. Like it's a love story, not the, the, the love of, uh, a boyfriend necessarily, but the, my loving relationships, not only with my friends, but also my family members. And then the, the loving relationship that I was able to find and curate with myself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you mentioned there uh, living your authentic self. And there were so many moments reading and also seeing you teach and taking class. There's so many times where 
I just sit there and think, oh, this is when it clicked for Tunde. This is when it, the moment that she found her power and she reclaimed that. And then you read a few more chapter, a few more pages and you're like, oh wait, no, this was the moment. This was the <laughs> moment. So when for you, do you think that you started to truly live as authentically Yatunde Oyunain? Every experience informs the next experience. I mean, you, you, you nailed it there where you're reading one moment, one experience, one lesson, and you say, okay, this is when, you know, she's beginning to step into her own. And then you turn the page and you say, no, this is the moment. And so I think there, I couldn't pinpoint one exact moment, but each tiny baby moment that I was able to be myself gave me license to show up in the next moment in a bigger way as more of myself. So, so each opportunity informed uh, the next and ultimately it's landed me here in this moment, which is still not fully developed and is still every day ever changing and growing. You were a makeup artist for, for 12 years and that was a passion and that was what you loved and you were good at it, you found success. Then you transitioned, you found, okay, Peloton. And then, you know, it didn't take long, Revlon ambassador, uh, New York Times bestselling author, uh, Nike athlete, right? You're, you continue to grow. And so I, I ask, what is your advice to people who want to grow in passion um, and to be okay with accepting that there are chapters of our lives and we can grow in passion? Like we can love something for t- a decade and that it is okay to love that and love something new. Um, and I think that's a really hard place for some people to feeling like they're letting go um, and that they don't deserve to have this new chapter. So what would you say to them? Yeah, I think it just requires being really honest with ourselves. It requires that we're really honest with ourselves. I think that we all know. Well, you know when something or someone no longer serves you, um, doubt enters and then we run from that feeling. We try to avoid it and escape it. Uh, I, uh, I lost my little brother unexpectedly when he was 19 years old. And then three years after that, also unexpectedly, I lost my dad. And then unexpectedly again, three years later, I lost my mom. And so within six years of one another, I lost half of my immediate family. Um, in losing them, I stepped into the greatest version of myself. I would do anything to have any one of them back. And in losing them, I stepped into the greatest version of myself and an an understanding of truly and really how short life is. And with that, I've made a promise to myself to live this life so fully. I live fully because they cannot. Um, And so every wish, every hope, every desire, every dream, every somewhat of a fantasy, um, I'm determined to play it out, to see it through, to at least try. You talk about grief and you talk about losing your brother, your mom, and then in your dad. Uh, one thing that stood out to me is talking about grieving in private with your brother and your dad and really letting go when you lost your mom. What changed for that to happen? Because I think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah, it was this, this feeling uh, of needing to, to be strong um, for, for my, my parents after losing my brother. If you, if, for anyone who's lost a parent or rather for anyone who's felt the pain of watching their parents lose a child, you almost become a parent that parents a parent. And then after losing my dad, my I watched my mother grieve her husband as I grieved my father. Um, and after I, lo- I lost my mother, I no longer felt that I needed to um, be strong for anyone. And so in that moment, I finally allowed myself to weep. And I think that as I wept, I not only wept for the loss of my mother, but I then finally grieved uh, the pain of losing my brother and my dad. And, 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 uh, in that moment, um, I hit my lowest low and I could have stayed there. I think I very, very easily could have stayed there. Uh, People around me would have allowed me to stay there because 
they would have said she's been through much, so much. Her joy is gone, but she's been through so much. Um, but instead, I, I, after some time, I came to this understanding that every single day is a new day. And so I want to allow myself to show up new with each day. We don't get to choose what happens, but we do get to choose how we react. And, um, and I, I led with that. And this brings us perfectly to the Speak Up Ride series in, in it, encouraging people to find their voice and to find their power to make change, um, which is so important. And, and I think uh, a, a big purpose of that, but can you talk about how the Speak Up series came to be? I read a little bit in the book about it. Um, I retook the class today and it hits different every time you take it. Yeah. yeah. In the best, in the best way, right. In the best you, I heard things this time. I didn't hear the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, so how did that come to be? The speak up, breathe and speak up series, um, is a series that I, the classes on the Peloton flat platform, um, the speak up ride came just after the murder of George Floyd. Um, my boss came to me and asked me if I wanted to a ride of solidarity, something to bring the community community together. Uh, not knowing, I, I'm sure she had no idea what I would do with it. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. Um, it was a Black Lives Matter movement, if you will, ride um, um, in which the community came together. Some 22,000 people took that ride live in one moment. Uh, to date, hundreds of thousands of people have now taken that ride. There were many people who DM'd me after the ride, telling them, telling me stories of how it personally affected them, about uncomfortable conversations that they had with their family members uh, after the ride. There were white men who messaged me and who said, I didn't take that ride. I found the, the term Black Lives Matter incredibly offensive. My wife made me watch that ride. And now I get it. I stand with you. Black Lives Matter. Um, there were principals and school teachers who damned me and said that they were going to, to put part of uh, moments within the ride into their curriculum. Yeah. yeah, I thought I think about some of the white women who on their page um, on social media wrote and said, I've never taken two days class before simply because we don't look alike. And because we don't look alike, I thought that maybe we'd have nothing in common. And I, I, I thanked them for, for owning that bias because I think it's that type of vulnerability and honesty that gets us through to the other side of change. Absolutely. What I also asked those women was, if you're unwilling to invest 20 minutes in me in a cycling class, simply because we look different, then would you invest two years or 20 years into someone that looked like me if you're a person of leadership? Um, at an organization. And so I think it's that type of, of thought uh, that's come out of, come, come out of that ride, that series. Yeah. Which is, which is amazing. Um, I know we're, we're, I, I want to be mindful of time and there's, there's a question I want to ask, and I'm going to read it verbatim. Um, when I do interviews like this, I always ask my close friends, uh, do you have, what would you ask? Um, knowing that there are different perspectives, different lived experiences. And one of my closest friends, um, I was a teammate with her in college. She wrote this to me this morning and she said, what is it like as a dark skinned black woman to be the new standard of beauty and inspiration of femininity, femininity when in the past, both being athletic and darker skinned were not the standard or represented. And now you are. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't take my space in this moment. I don't take it for granted. I understand exactly what it means. What does it feel like? Um, it feels like I wish that this, that this uh, was, I wish that I was able to see more examples of myself when I was a child. And um, I, I, it feels great. It feels great, not just for me, um, and not just for people that look like me, I think of young black children, um, and, and, you know, so often I receive DMs, mothers taking pictures of their kids, either looking at me on the screen 
on the bike or looking at me in a magazine. And, and I get it. I get what they're, what they're saying in those pictures. Um, representation matters, but I don't think that representation matters solely to the group that's being represented to see children that are not black, white, Asian, Hispanic, to see them also watch me and to see future allies um, being form created, uh, that feels good too. Uh, wildly important and so, so necessary. And I don't take it for granted. I know that you have to go. So I'm going to do a quick rapid fire if that's okay. Let's do it. Okay. Um, your favorite type of ride to program. To program? Hit. Okay. Favorite type of ride to take? Are they different? Low of that. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, must have makeup product in your in your bag. Oh, mascara or lip gloss. Okay. Um, favorite exercise outside of cycling. Boot camp. Um, ideal girls' night. Oh, beach, fire, drinks, cheese, cheese. Must include the cheese. Favorite, <laughs> favorite podcast to listen to. Fitness Flip Podcast, Peloton. <laughs> it's great. Your favorite book other than Speak? Uh, Brene Brown, Daring Greatly, my favorite book of all time. That's a good one. Biggest fear? Biggest fear, letting fear steer. Biggest fear, allowing fear to hold me hostage. If you could go anywhere in the world right now, hop on a plane, where are you going? Thailand, Thailand. Pack your bags, sis. We're going. Let's go. <laughs> Sign me up. I'm with you. Um, final question, dream podcast guest. Manifest it today. Manifest it. Be one episode, and Michelle Obama would be there. Oprah would be there, and Beyonce would be there, and Brene. Okay, done, done. I let them go. Everybody, bring everybody. <laughs> awesome. I love that. I'm listening. So, um, Tunde, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to do this. I appreciate you. I appreciate this conversation, um, and I look forward to the next time that we're able to to connect. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.